<laughs> We're just after 6 p.m. here in Ontario, Canada, and so I'd like to start things off. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Ann Fannin, and on behalf of the Seawell Professional Development Committee, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a very special webinar, the Sherborg QUT Project, A Narrative of Engagement. And I know that many of you are joining us at odd hours of the day, and that's because we're fortunate enough to have speakers today who are joining us all the way from Brisbane, Australia, where it's already 9 a.m. tomorrow morning for us. Yes. So <laughs> I'd like to give a very warm welcome to those speakers, Dr. Deb Duthie from the School of Public Health and Social Work at the Faculty of Health, and Catherine Campbell from the Law School and the Faculty of Law, both from the Queensland University of Technology. I first met Deb and Catherine at uh, an ASIN, which is the Australian Collaborative Education Network Conference, so the Seawill equivalent in Australia. Um, and Catherine, Deb, and I were scheduled in the same session for our conference presentations. Uh, and while I would typically be preoccupied with thinking about my own upcoming presentation, I very quickly became fascinated by the Sherberg QUT project and the great work being done there. Uh, and shortly after I returned home to Canada, I reflected on how fortunate I was to learn from Deb and Catherine at that ASIN conference and suggested to the PD committee that we invite them to present to the Seawell membership. Fortunately, the PD committee and Deb and Catherine, most importantly, agreed. And so um, six months later, on a cold winter day in Canada, and I see a hot summer morning in Brisbane, uh, we're here hot. together. <laughs> very hot there. Very yeah. hot today, very hot and humid, and we are looking at maybe having a cyclone approaching soon, so it's very hot and humid here. 34 oh, degrees today. 34 degrees. I don't yeah. know, we might take some of it right about now. <laughs> So we're finally here together, and I couldn't be more pleased. Um, I'm just going to make a really, uh, couple of really quick administrative notes uh, before passing things off to Deb and Catherine. So uh, those of you that have joined us on webinars before know that we mute the phone lines so we can cut down on the background noise. So your, um, your audio has been muted. If you have questions throughout the a presentation, please enter them in the chat box that you'll see in the lower left corner of your screen. And then when Deb and Catherine are finished presenting, um, I'll moderate and pass them along to our presenters. Uh, and with that, I will gladly pass things along with a lot of gratitude to Deb and Catherine to introduce their work. Okay, thanks, Anne. And um, hi, everyone um, from sunny Australia. Deb, that was Deb. Oh, sorry, yes, Deb, I should say. And hi, it's Catherine Campbell here as well. So thank you very much, Anne, for that lovely um, introduction. And I'll um, pass it over to Deb. Mm -hmm. So what we thought um, today is that uh, I'd give a little introduction about um, the Sherberg Aboriginal community um, and then talk about um, the, uh, the projects and, and what we've achieved since we've sort of... Um, been collaborating and, and being in partnership with the community. Um, so the project's been going for, um, oh, actually, hang on, let's do our acknowledgement first. Yeah. Okay, so as per Aboriginal terms of reference, um, we just want to acknowledge the tr tr tradi traditional custodians of the land in which we're meeting and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And we'd also like to acknowledge the Waka Waka peoples who are the traditional uh, custodians of Sherberg, with whom we are in a respectful partnership and collaboration. And just on that point, because um, I was at a conference recently and I'm, I'm not sure whether um, in, in Canada and the US you use the um, acknowledgement, but this is now a practice in Australia for acknowledging the traditional land. And um, it's a very important part of raising awareness and understanding in Australia about um, the role of our Indigenous peoples and their traditional custodianship. So um, this is something that we now do for all our presentations. And I was asked a question about it at a conference in Melbourne by my North American colleagues. So I just thought I'd highlight why we do that. Yep, okay. 
So back to Deb. All right, so why we do it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so part of, uh, I guess, Aboriginal terms of reference uh, for us too is to um, sort of uh, tell people about it, yeah, about us. And, um, and it's more than just sort of saying, well, yes, I'm a, an academic uh, in the School of um, Social Work. So we're just going to give you a bit of a um, background um, of us. Um, so that's me. Um, um, I was a... a adopted into a non-Indigenous family uh, in the 60s. It was quite common um, at that time. And um, I traced my family, uh, my Aboriginal family, um, oh, about 25 years ago or so. So I'll just uh, point out the, the lady on the um, top left there is my uh, great-great-grandmother from Sherberg. Um, and um, the lady on the on the right is my great great grandmother from the Northern Territory. So um, my grandmother was removed from the Northern Territory um, when uh, under the protection of that. And uh, if you have a look on the map there, um, uh, where that black arrow is, um, so she was removed as as a child um, from the top of Australia, basically uh, down to where Sherberg now stands. So her and her four siblings were removed uh, from their family uh, back then. So, so yes, my, my grandmother there on the, the bottom right, uh, she's the Warramundu side of the family. Um, and uh, the gentleman next to her is my grandfather, who's the Waka Waka side of the family. So um, he's a Sherberg man. He's a, um, he was a traditional owner up there. And then my story. So, um, you know, Deb brings that, you know, her Indigenous heritage um, and, you know, the, her connections with Sherberg to this project. And that's a very valuable part of the um, project team for her to have those, that story to share with our students. Mine is far more of the, you know, the white heritage. So, I mean, I've learned a lot from Deb. And my story there on that, you can see... Um, the kookaburras, uh, obviously a very Australian um, symbol, but that's on my taken on my back deck. So, yep, we have the kookaburras who visit us in our backyard on our deck. And the picture of the beach is where I grew up in Tasmania. So I come from um, down south. Uh, some people wonder if it is part of Australia. Tasmania is definitely part of Australia and also has very strong um, Indigenous history which interestingly my brother has written about. So um, I have very strong ties and connections with Tasmania, but that beach of course is not the warm sunny one that many of you associate with Australia, it's very cold. And then over on the right hand side, um, the, the picture of about, you know, questioning about the crises in law and access to justice symbolises my commitment to social justice, access to justice. And what I try to teach my law students is um, the need for them to find ways to um, connect the law and justice. And that goes way beyond just working in a commercial practice. And so I'm trying to show them the ways that they can connect and particularly work in an interdisciplinary context to, as it says, figure out how we can solve access to justice issues. And the photo on the right is, was taken last week in Bhutan with students. So I've just returned from two and a half weeks in Bhutan working with my students um, there. So we did project uh, community legal education work with high schools. And um, so there I am on the left-hand side. I'm looking a little bit tubbier there because I've got a lot of layers on. It was very cold. So, <laughs> but, um, that, that also symbolises that some of the work I do with my law students. So I thought that that's a bit of my story. Okay, so I thought we'd have a, uh, it would be best to do a bit of a history of, um, of Sherberg. Um, so uh, Sherberg was, um, I guess, uh, situated um, in 1904 as a, um, an Aboriginal reserve. So lots of people were, you know, Indigenous peoples were uh, removed from families and country and, um, and were, were moved to the Barambah 
um, Aboriginal Reserve. Um, the Act was um, very strict, the Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act. Um, basically, it was instigated for the protection of Aboriginal people from white settlers. Um, at the time, there had been there were lots of massacres occurring because uh, settlers wanted to um, move into the pastoral lands. So they were actually removing people from land so they could use it for um, beef, cattle, um, you know, sheep and, and crops as well. And providing them with opium. So which hence the, hence the reason for the name of the act. Yeah. So selling, taking their land and giving them opium, basically. Mm. Yeah. So um, so the legislation was, was uh, allowed complete control over Aboriginal people's lives. Um, so they would uh, have chief protectors appointed um, with superintendents on, on site. Um, the idea was to actually um, discard those savage customs of nomadic life and, um, and bring up children in a civilised and Christian way. I mean, so we, our history it has some similarities with um, Canada's history as well. Um, people were forbidden from practising their own cultural traditions or speaking language and and you can see see this now um, uh, in contemporary Australia where um, there's very few Indigenous languages that are still being spoken. Um, so that was just um, enforced um, in that people couldn't, couldn't share those traditions. Um, it restricted contact between Aboriginal people and outsiders. So um, the government were very um, clear that they didn't want um, uh, Aboriginal people and white people um, raising families and such. I think one of the one of the, the biggest things that occurred for us was um, the the dormitory system, um, which they would take uh, lighter skinned um, Aboriginal children away from family, and would place them into uh, the dormitory system. So, and this is where um, um, when we talk about our stolen generation, um, are a lot of these the kids that were taken um, back in those days. So if you have it, it's just a couple of photos here. So um, in Sherbourg, this is in 1930, um, there was the, the girls' dorm. So they had three dormitories on, um, on Sherbourg land. Uh, what, there was a boys' dorm, um, a girls' dorm, and a, a young women's dorm. Um, so uh, boys would be moved into the dormitories um, and they would be taught skills such as carpentry and um, you know, saw milling and those sorts of things. The girls would be um, taught um, domestic work, yep. so how to look after families and, and whatnot. Um, once those kids actually reached an age of around the 12, 13, they were then sent um, from the community out to, to work on pastoral lands, um, quite often out west. Um, work on property so the girls would be doing the laundry cooking you know that sort of as a as an unpaid servant in the house in at, for the property owners mm. the white property owners white property owners yeah yeah the, some of the, the really big issues that came up with that though was that there are a lot of young women there who were um sexually abused by um uh the the white managers the stockmen out there so a lot of um, young women were returning um, pregnant. So the, the mother's dorm uh, was used for the young women with their um, babies, uh, and that's where they would stay. When the children reached about three or four, they would be moved into the girls or boys' dorms, and the women would be, again, sent back out to work. So there was no control whatsoever. Um, for those young women and no support in terms of the abuse that they experienced. Um, so uh, the other part of the dormitory system, and uh, and this was uh, certainly occurred out at Sherbourg, is that they, they had a six foot fence with uh, rolled barbed wire along the top. So the children could see their parents and family and the parents could see the children, but they weren't allowed to talk to each other unless mm -hmm. they had special permission. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a really um, uh, it's brutal and, and barbaric yeah. in terms of treatment. Turn of our history, yeah. 
Yeah, the other fellow, the photo that I have of um, um, one of the, the black figures, so quite a, a number of men, Aboriginal men, went over to um, uh, fight in several of the wars going back from the Boer War, um, etc. Never really recognised their, um, their contribution. Um, you know, uh, on return uh, from the war, our, um, our white soldiers would receive uh, packages of land in thanks for, you know, um, supporting the country. Um, Aboriginal men went straight back to the reserve and didn't get any uh, land handouts at all. Well, I think it's important also to, re to um, recognise or record the fact that Aboriginal people in Australia were not even included as part of the population and, and the census um, in Australia under the constitution until 1967. So they were regarded and referred to in our constitution until 1967 as flora and fauna. So those soldiers who served in the First and Second World Wars were not recognised in any way. Um, their service, they, they weren't regarded as citizens of Australia in the same way as white Australians. Okay, shall we move to the next one? Okay, so um, <coughs> some changes occurred uh, uh, then the the Barimba Reserve was renamed the Sherberg Aboriginal Reserve in 1931 um, and uh, and it sort of, uh, as, as, as the years went by, it changed from a welfare institution to the Sherberg community. So um, in 1966, uh, they got their own Sherberg Aboriginal uh, Council. The year before the referendum, which changed their status from flora and fauna. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, around 68, um, they became an actual community. Um, so they were provided... Um, um, a deed of grant in trust, so it's, it's what we call Doggett land. Um, and uh, that was um, provided by the government, and probably Catherine, you can explain it yeah. a bit better so here. So that was in 1986, just to clarify that date. Um, yeah, so the Doggett um, land is actually not, um, as it sounds, they're not given complete self-control. It's where land is held in trust, but the state government uh, maintains ultimate control. So this is the situation now. So Sherberg is a dogged community, meaning that they have the right to make their own regulations and bylaws, but all of that must be approved by the state government and um, ultimately state government has control. So whilst they are self-administering now, there is still a high level of control by the state and that's um, some of the work that the law students are doing, particularly where, as we will explain in a moment, where the um, council makes um, regulations and bylaws, but they must comply with state government requirements. Mm. Yeah, what it also means is that um, any resources under the ground or above the ground um, belong to the government, so that's Crown land. Um, so what we have then is a, um, a community where um, People can't own any of the land because it's owned by the Crown, um, which means people, all people are renting. Um, so unlike, you know, um, most people who, you know, uh, they get an inheritance from selling a house or, or whatnot, uh, no one in Sherberg is able to do that. Yeah. So they have no freehold title of land. It's all held um, by state and so they can only rent their property. They can never own their house. Okay, and that really um, you know, it puts quite a huge strain on um, um, people's ability to get out of poverty and to, to move forward. Um, so I, I think I believe there's a 99-year lease. Yes. That was um, Sherberg is, is under. Okay. Okay, so... Um, when the when people were started to be to be moved down to Sherberg from various uh, places in Queensland and the Northern Territory, um, they estimated that there was about 44 different tribal groups of people um, who were all put on this one piece of land. So the you know the community has has had its challenges with um, people with different um, 
traditions and practices and such. Um, and different all, languages. And different languages, yeah. yeah. Um, all of a sudden being forced to, to live together. However, as, as time's gone on, um, people have adapted, you know, and, um, you know, and I guess strength in numbers. But Sherberg's, um, I guess, Monaco is many tribes, one community. Um, so they acknowledge that there are um, the traditional owners there, the Waka Waka peoples, but they also acknowledge that there's many other um, tribal groups there as well. Um, I think it's um, it's only a small community. It's probably about 1,500 to 2,000 people. Um, it's quite transient. You know, people will will leave um, and maybe go down to the major cities, but tend to um, to always go back. Um, they have a thriving pottery industry now. Um, it's called Refire. Um, back in the when it was the Baramba Reserve, they had a, a quite a huge pottery um, uh, factory. In, in, Sher in Sherberg. Um, in the 80s, when the government actually pulled out of... Out of um, when it became a dogged community. Yeah, when it became a dogged community. Uh, the government took all of the um, resources that they needed to, to sustain the, the pottery. Including the pottery kiln. Yes, or took everything. So people were left with nothing. So that, that, sort of, um, uh, that sort of phased out. It was only about one or two years ago that they um, started... Uh, the pottery industry again, and it's just taking off. It's going so well. Mm. Um, so that's something that's happened in quite recently in the time that we've been working with Sherberg. We've seen quite a few changes in the community. So we've been there for, um, you know, really with taking students since 2012, and many of these the things on this list have really only happened in the last few years. So the pottery industry is fun, as is the, the training cafe and the recycling plant. So it's really exciting for us to see um, these positive changes occurring in the community. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, I think what sort of um, initiated all this change was they, they uh, put up a, a museum precinct. Um, and you can see that's one of the photos up the, on the top uh, right-hand side there. Uh, so it's a really um, uh, well-researched historical um, precinct where the elders will take groups of, you know, tour groups around and talk about what the community used to be like. Um, and that actually includes one of the, the boys' dormitories um, still exists and there's a tour of that. So as part of our work, we um, an orientation for students, we um, visits the ration shed the museum and the boys dormitory so um, they they are exposed to that history mm. yeah yeah um, I guess our view is that you can't understand the present unless you understand the past so um, it is just imperative for students to understand um, about this community and its history and how the, the resilience that um, people have shown um, over the years Okay, so just a bit of a, um, a view on how sort of our, our program has been working. So there's kind of two arms to it. So there's a placement arm where social work, human services and paramedic students go to community and do their placements there. Mm -hmm. And the other arm that um, Catherine is more involved in is sort of like the independent study arm or um, a, a legal clinic sort of uh, yep. space. Yeah, so with Deb's um, with the placement arm, students are doing their social work or paramedics or whatever, you know, long-term placements. So they're doing a minimum of 200 hours, 200 to 500 hours. Mm. So those students, as we'll explain in a moment, they actually live up at, at, in, in Mergen or nearby, where, and they might be doing work in... Um, Mergen is the nearest town, big town to Sherberg. So it's only a 15-minute drive. So the students are actually living up there. Um, my students and also those um, from business and creative industries and so on, they are working on projects back in Brisbane and we travel to Sherberg um, three or four times during the semester, usually for day trips, but occasionally we stay overnight. So um, at my students link with those students who are doing placements in Sherberg and are there for a longer term. Yeah, the really um, positive thing I think um, is that students get that transdisciplinary link. So, you know, we have law students who um, are working with social work students and 
there's very, very different ways of, of working. So our law students see the outcome, mm -hmm. social work students see the processes in between. So they, they're actually learning from each other in a really, really good way. Yes. So, what? Okay, so we'll just have a look at how we sort of started it. So 2010, 2011, um, I, was teaching uh, Master of Social Work students. And um, we, uh, I approached the community and, and asked if, um, you know, we could come up and, so students would be able to see um, how Indigenous practitioners actually work um, within an Indigenous space. So we went up to um, a number of um, services. So the Department of Youth Justice, um, Drug and Alcohol Rehab Centre, we looked at the primary school, et cetera. And we talked to people who actually worked in those services, so they'd get a bit of an idea um, around what that was about. Yeah, and then um, completely unrelated, so I, did, I wasn't aware of the work that Deb was doing at that time, but I have um, one of my law students who is also an in, um, Indigenous um, woman, and she's, there's a, you can't really see Linda, but she's there on the left in that photo with the radio ice mob. Linda um, okay. asked, approached me to do a uh, project working in um, Sherberg where she was an Indigenous Liaison Officer and she wanted to undertake, do some work there as part of a placement in one of my law um, work integrated learning units. So um, through Linda's work with um, the radio station, she prepared um, a, and um, presented a project on legal rights and responsibilities. So the radio station um, would broadcast those sessions. She organised the interviews with lawyers and um, it was done to assist the community understand particular issues that they'd identified where they didn't feel or might not feel comfortable um, going to see a lawyer because, and also because of um, you know, issues relating to privacy and want, you know, just generally wanting information on topics but um, they didn't particularly feel comfortable asking about it. So it was a very interesting project that Linda identified in her role as an Indigenous Liaison Officer with the Department of Justice. And that seemed such an important project to me that I, um, I didn't like to just let it end after one semester. So I applied for an engagement innovation grant from our university to, so that we could further develop that project. And that's how I started working with Deb. So um, through applying for that grant, I then found out what other people in the university were doing and approached them to support me with the grant, which we were successful in, in getting. And that really is how we started. Back yeah. in, so um, the conversation started happening in 2013 and um, you know, I certainly couldn't have done this without Deb and her understanding of community. And I think that's a really important aspect because I have learned so much in the last um, five, six years. Um, my understanding of working with Indigenous communities was really non-existent back then, but I knew that I needed to have somebody who did understand, and so I you know, approached Deb who, and the Ujuru unit, which is our unit here at the University supporting Indigenous students. And you can see the, the initial project team, and that was the um, that photo was taken back in 2013. And what Deb really em emphasised was the importance of, of those conversations. Mm. So we really spent a year having those conversations, going mm. up to Sherberg and meeting with the elders and um, the community. I think mm. that's a really important thing to emphasise is it's very much based on um, you know, building a relationship of trust. Mm. Yeah, and it, it, took a, it took a long time to, um, for everyone to feel comfortable, I guess. But it was uh, it was the first thing that we needed to do. So then, in 2014, we um, we had a, a social work placement student up there, and uh, he also had family living up there. So he actually immersed himself in the community, and uh, we we worked on a project with students uh, of the Baramba Justice Initiative. Yeah. So within our conversations with the, the local justice group and uh, elders and, and other people in the community, um, we, we asked them, you know, what, what sort of, if we could do a project for you, what would it be? Um, uh, and their uh, response was, what would it take to re reduce the overrepresentation of young people in the, 
in Cherbourg in the youth justice system. Mm. Um, there is, you know, there is um, uh, quite a bit of youth crime up there, but it's uh, the way I see it, it is like any other um, suburb or small township. You know, there are always people who are going to be in the justice system. Mm. So we developed a protocol between the, the Aboriginal Shire Council and uh, and QUT, and um, uh, we both signed off on that, and that sort of um, sort of cemented our relationship a little bit, I think. Yeah. And I think it's important to emphasise that this started as a service learning project, and it is still a service learning project. Um, whilst there have been some changes um, in the last few years to the way units are offered, we run, we still run this as a service learning project. So initially, um, our university supported it through what we called the Community Engaged Learning Lab. That no longer exists, unfortunately, but we still there adopt the service learning principles. And um, I know that that's a big part of um, what is happening in you know Canada and the US. And it's something that is still um, being developed in Australian universities. It doesn't have the focus that you have um, in North America, but um, a, a very important and something that um, you know I'm really trying to develop through my legal clinic and in, and we have other academics in the, our university who are also trying to work on that. Mm. And one of, one of our, um, our must-dos, and this is how we actually, um, I guess, ensure that the community is aware of what we're doing at every step of the way. At the end of the semester, the, the students write up a report and that gets presented to the community and um, the community gets a, a copy of the report. Um, and these things can be used for, um, you know, funding opportunities, um, you know, um, just of interest about, you know, so people know what's happening in the community as well. It's also an important part of our process because one of the things we emphasise with students is that, that, that change and working with an Indigenous community takes time and it's not about what they want, it's about what the community wants. And for the, the handover process is a sign of our continuing commitment to the community and provides the students who are coming in the next semester with a summary of the work that's been done before. Sometimes the community asks us to do something different, but there is still um, a document and things that they can refer to so that they can understand how the previous group of students have worked and what information um, they, they've prepared for the community. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very important part of the, of the continuity of our project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, we don't always get outcomes after one semester. No. So um, what happens is the next team of students who go up there, it's sort of the project sort of rolls over and they continue with it. So, and that's worked quite well for yeah. the past six or so years. Law students struggle with that. <laughs> they like an outcome and that's a big part of the learning for them. Um, managing that uncertainty, not being in control, they're not things that law students um, typically have. <laughs> um, so it, it's really valuable learning for them. It's a very different process. And every student who's done this project, every law student has found it invaluable in um, helping them to understand community work and also to learn so much more about themselves. So that's actually a group um, that in that photo from, uh, of law students, apart from one on the far left who's um, a social work student, but the others are all law students. And they've, you know, they're all now admitted as lawyers and interesting, doing some very interesting things. But, um, so, you know, it is exceptionally valuable, I think, for law students to understand mm -hmm. yeah. and work on this project. And it shifted their focus to a little bit around um, going into law firms, you know, they, you know but yeah. thinking about community lawyering and, and those sorts of things. Yes, in fact, Ben there is now a community lawyer, so that's always very gratifying. Mm. Okay, so moving on. Um, so what effectively has happened is that we've got multidisciplinary across QUT projects um, uh, to work on integrated learning. Um, so the, the idea is that the community partner initiates projects, so we don't go out to community and say, you could do this. It's all about community initiating it. Mm. Um, we support, so we have student teams supported by at least one academic, so typically it's usually about two, isn't it? Yes. Um, 
Yeah, and we have individual reflective and or group assessments. So it, it's good for students to actually reflect on what they're seeing, what they're hearing, um, and how they're managing um, such a big different uh, way of looking at the world. Mm. Um, we've got to have outcomes for our industry partner as well. So, um, yeah, the, the reflection certainly um, is based on understanding their own privilege. Um, so we do a lot of work um, on white privilege and um, cultural competence or cultural humility, as I like to call it, um, intercultural awareness. Deb works with the students and we have a, a workshop at the beginning of the semester on culturally safe practices. So that's um, particularly for um, the non-Indigenous students on this project. They're um, often very confused and unsure of what's appropriate language, how should I um, act. Um, so we've got to reach the situation in Australia where many people feel uncomfortable now um, discussing Indigenous issues. They're not sure what their response should be because there's been such, you know, there's been quite a lot of coverage about um, racism in Australia. So the, the students genuinely want to know and it's a very important part of our project to provide a safe environment for them to learn and um, that's another invaluable role that Deb takes. As many of, and also the other Indigenous students that we have working, yeah. they've been really wonderful support and that's been a, 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 um, an outcome from the project that I'm, you know, that the students have said was very important for them to be able to feel that they are learning in a safe environment and they can ask questions. Hmm. Okay, so yes, as Catherine said, we have an orientation workshop um, uh, which is actually on tomorrow for our new students. Um, and just to sort of, um, so students understand the history of the community, they start thinking about how they as, a, as people are going to impact on the people that they will be seeing and talking to uh, in community. <coughs> um, then we take them to Sherberg. In yeah. another week or two, we'll be in Sherberg and they will undertake the ration shed tour with the elders and actually, you know, feed the community, which for some of them comes as a shock. As one student, law student said to me last semester, she said, I didn't expect to see, just looks like another suburb. Um, there's houses and lawns and kids playing. I said, well, what did you expect to see? Yeah. <laughs> so they have an image of an Aboriginal community, which is often completely at odds with, with the reality. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and there's, there's research to say that um, um, about 90% of non-Indigenous people have actually interacted with Aboriginal people. So that's they what haven't, that haven't, haven't, haven't interacted. Have yeah. not yet. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've explained that they enrol in their particular discipline units, but we do have workshops that they're required to attend um, depending on wh which discipline they're in. There is overlap sometimes, and that's a challenge for us. So, um, you know, um, getting students to attend workshops that are outside their discipline can be quite difficult from a timetabling point of view, but we managed to work around that. Mm -hmm. um, Deb spoke about the provision of accommodation and we rent a house up there for the students who are on placement. And the other students, um, like my law students, will attend. We, we, take, we go up to Sherberg usually at least four times during the semester. Um, and during, in between, when they're working back in Brisbane, they um, meet with their academic supervisors and mentors, and and with the group, they also you know can um, schedule you know have meetings with people in Sherberg. They often use phone um, links and things like that. Mm. So we also have a Blackboard site which provides I don't know if you call it Blackboard or Moodle, um, where they all the information related to the project is available for the students, including any of the handover reports. Hmm. Okay, so this is kind of, this conceptualises our involvement with Sherberg. Um, so it's underpinned by participatory action research, um, but we're always looking for um, other possibilities and opportunities that might arise just through having discussions uh, with people. Um, so, you know, and I guess, um, if we if the community identifies a particular project, 
um, our question to ourselves is, well, what would it take for us for this to, to occur? Yeah. And it's often in a serendipitous conversation. So we might be up there just having uh, a morning tea with um, one of the members of community and they'll mention something and then we'll think, oh, well, you know, maybe there's something that we could do to help with that issue. So we'll then start having the conversation about, well, what sort of things could, you know, could would you like to see or how could we how could we assist you? And that then often leads to the project. Yeah. One of the key things that we, we did from the beginning was to set up a, um, some core operating principles um, that we developed with the Sherberg Health Action Group um, and it's about how, how we, and that's students and staff, conduct ourselves within the community um, and we get students and staff to sign off on these so that you know they're aware. Yeah. But basically a lot of the principles is, is uh, ensures that Sherberg is in control of this whole project. Yep. Uh, so they're the ultimate authority. Um, staff and students must appreciate their learners in respect to the culture of Sherberg and be respectful at all times. Um, topics are invited from uh, community. Um, the plans are adapted. Uh, it's ongoing communication, whether it's by phone, or face to face. Um, so we just need to to keep filling people in and letting them know what where we're up to. Yeah. As um, part of that, we have a um, students must prepare a project plan around about week five of the semester, so that um, the community and the people they're working with in community can see what their students are planning to do, and and um, often for the students there are adjustments at that point. And as I said, for law students that can be quite challenging, challenging but mm. it's a very um, good part of the process as well, because it's part of that, part of the participatory action research. Mm. Yes, we also um, uh, provide a lot of information around the protocols, but students have also got to learn that each Indigenous community will have their own particular protocols. So um, uh, we, we did have uh, an Indigenous student who went up there and, and uh, she did a protocol booklet that covered um, a lot of things that um, students wouldn't know about, but needed to know about. Yeah. Okay, so some of our projects so far. Um, with the uh, in conversation, we um, found that some basic first aid programs would have been really useful. For example, we have a men's shed up there, so you've got lots of um, young men using power tools and such. So while the paramedic students are um, doing their placement up there, they also go out to community and do some really basic first aid stuff like, you know, what happens if you cut yourself um, and, and those sorts of things. Probably one of the, the bigger projects has been the, the Sherberg Youth Council development. Um, that's, that's still going, but we've started, but it's um, like all young people, um, they're a bit hard to get engaged sometimes, but um, I think, yeah, we're working towards that. Um, certainly. Uh, what we do here, the the uh, young woman there, um, Iris, she's a community member, so um, we wanted to provide some capacity building for members of community as well, so we employed her to act as a community facilitator. For the Youth Council. For the Youth Council, yeah. Okay, um, one of our uh, Indigenous students, um, she uh, collected elders' stories and um, and uh, put it up on a, a piece of beautiful bunya pine that uh, you can actually get from community. Um, and the she, local timber. Local timber, yeah. Um, and what we wanted was um, something that we could put in community where the young people could see and and you know think about. So um, the elders. Uh, chose a particular uh, saying within their um, their interview, and um, we put that on the board as well. So, and they hang up in the Indigenous Knowledge Centre, which is a centre for um, all members of the community. So, um, just some of the other projects you can see listed there. Um, you can see that we have, you know, that we've had students now in, involved in many things happening in community. From, 
the law and justice students that I've been working with, we've been particularly involved in the Sherbrooke Council bylaw changes, and my students have been um, working on community consultation. So, um, as an indicator of you know the role of, as a Dovet community, they must comply with the state government workplace health and safety laws and other regulation, uh, other state laws, and through they've had to change some of their um, local laws. But what my students pointed out was the importance of community consultation and education so that people would understand the change and be able to have a say. And um, it's interesting that the process that our state government followed was to simply appoint um, a legal firm to audit the council laws and then insist that these would be the changes. So it's been an interesting process for my students to, under to see how the state government has approached it and then to support um, Sherbrooke Council in implementing those changes. So that's our ongoing. Um, so you can see the list of um, the other projects that we've been involved in. I don't think we need to go through those. If you have any questions, we can, we can take those yeah. at the end. Okay, so, so in general, I mean, that's the, the people um, in community, the agencies that we all link with, um, uh, to actually provide a, a sort of holistic yeah. um, a way of working with the community. Okay. One of the biggest things that we push in here uh, for students and staff is that community is the educator. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot to learn from um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So, uh, that's one of our key, key notes. For community, you know, we, we try and do that capacity building of employing community members. Um, it, uh, having a, a university presence there um, also allows um, young people and, you know, school children to have an idea of what opportunities in terms of it, education might be available to them. Yep. Um, and we respond to the needs of the community. And for us as, well, my, speaking for myself, and I think it's true for other staff involved, that we've um, certainly increased our knowledge of working within an Indigenous context and I mean, an understanding of Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing. That's been a really important learning curve for me and so, as I think also for the students and um, some, developed some really lovely relationships within the community. Mm. Um, and... Deb's list, we've listed there where um, some of our students have been employed within the Sherberg Mergen community. So that's been a great outcome as well. Yeah, so in the terms of rural social work, um, it's about getting social work students up there to experience what rural um, communities are like. And a lot of, you know, quite a few are staying and really enjoying it. I suppose we, one thing we didn't emphasise, it's a three and, three and a half hour drive from Brisbane. Mm. So that gives you some context to how it's. Um, yep. Northwest of Brisbane. Okay, some of our challenges, and that's the house we rent. Um, but you know, some of the challenges are, you know, I've got obligations uh, to uh, to community because my family um, were residents there. Um, so that just makes us uh, be really careful about which students we we pick yeah. to be on. Um, on the project. Um, uh, we, we interview the students before we accept them for this project because it's, you know, it could so easily destroy the relationship we've, we've built up over time if we have the wrong students. We have to have, make mm. sure that we have students who are respectful and um, we, we believe will be appropriate mm. for the project. Yeah, yeah. So just other costs for accommodation for students and the cost of travel because we actually go up there quite a bit. Um, for for Catherine and I as academics, it's a it's an increase in our workload, but it's one that's not recognised. Um, so it doesn't acknowledge our contribution uh, to it. Which, but we're working on that. Yeah, and I know that many many people would would you know that's true of most um, academics who are involved in any service learning projects. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, the university always has a timeline on it. Well, for us, the process is more important, and um, so we don't rush. It's actually about making the university look at it from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, quite often, there's sorry business 
in community um, and if, if that is occurring we, um, we don't do any visits. Um, and there's also been quite a bit of negative media presentation um, around Sherberg uh, as well. Yeah, but that's also part of the learning process for students that what they see in the media is not what is re reflected in reality yeah. very often. Okay, and just the impacts. I mean, it's about sharing and contributing information, students supporting each other. Um, there's good transdisciplinary outcomes. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's the consultation, it's the reciprocity that we have with the community that um, I think um, is why I continue doing it, even though it doesn't show up in our workload or anything. And, so, and I think for me, it's the different ways of thinking about situations and context, which is so important for future lawyers to learn about, um, or for any future, any professionals, and that it opens up their own education and knowledge um, to an area, such an important part of Australian history. Okay, so that's just the, the different faculties and schools that are involved um, in, in the project on and off. Um, and that's just our contact numbers if you would like to um, have any other sort of discussions um, outside of this. Yeah, so feel free to email us and we'll take questions now, Anne. Fabulous. That was so spectacular, and I was I sent you a note. I don't know if you saw it in the middle of the presentation. I appreciate how difficult it is to go through that whole presentation without any feedback from your audience, um, but I was certainly nodding and smiling. Um, and, oh, thank uh, you. And I, I can see the questions now. You're right. We weren't <laughs> looking at them, but I can see Yasmin's asked a question about how do we know if they'll be suitable. Um, that's a very interesting question. So we asked them um, if they've ever worked with, you know, well, yeah, perhaps you're the best person to answer this or not, unless she's eating a great answer. <laughs> so um, what we're looking for are students who are open-minded. Um, so we asked them if they've ever worked, um, or, you know, what they know about Indigenous Australia. Um, very often, they, if they're honest, they'll say um, they don't know very much. Um, so we don't want somebody who's going to fudge and, and make up something. But, you know, looking for a student who's also done community work, that's, a, that's an important thing. We're looking for people who are, who are willing to put themselves outside their comfort zone. So um, thinking of the two law students we had last semester, um, one is just, was just a very open, um, he, he's, he'd come from a very privileged background, but acknowledged that and said, I really would like to learn more about um, Indigenous communities and my Australian history. So he presented as a very open, genuine student. The other student I could see, she also came from a privileged background and said the same thing, but was also clear to me had less flexibility. But we knew that if we paired her with um, Lockie, the more flexible, flexible student that she would learn a lot. So we, we, we are conscious that there are students that we may need to provide more support to and we did mm. um, mentor her quite closely and her, the learning outcomes for her were profound. She was the student who had images of the Sherberg community that were you know, nothing like the reality and she really, in, in terms of learning, she probably learned more than the, than the male student, Lockie, mm. but um, they both um, were excellent. So we, I think we've we've managed. Um, if we're concerned about a student, we we've, we closely mentor them, and we make sure they are paired with other students. And, and because Deb teaches the Indigenous Knowledges Unit, some of the students come onto this project from there, so Deb knows them quite well. Mm -hmm. And that's been um, a way of managing if we're unsure if the students will be um, suitable. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we make it. Uh, really clear that, that students want to go up there to commit to the community um, to get their own learning yeah. um, and are not just going up there because they want to see, you know, what an Indigenous community looks like and, yes. and, and, and stuff. So we're really careful about the questions we ask them and, and their responses. So, and to I hope that answered your question to some extent, Yasmin, yes. and when we first started, what we were most surprised and challenged by, for me, um, what I was most surprised by was my ignorance. I was shocked that I 
had lived in Australia for you know, 50 years and knew nothing about the history of the um, communities like Sherberg and that really shocked me and, and, and I was ashamed. So um, I feel it's a very important part now to not just to educate students but also my peers um, about uh, the history of stolen generations and, and the ongoing impact of that intergenerational trauma that has occurred because many Australians believe that it's, um, you know, it happened in the past so but get over it and it's not a problem now. But the trauma that occurred through taking children away and forcing people to live in, well, in treating them as slaves essentially um, is something that Australia hasn't acknowledged and that's a big, that's probably been the most challenging and thing for me. Hmm. Um, challenging, I guess, for me, um, even though my family um, lived in Sherberg and they were very well respected um, community members as well, the challenge for me was that I was still, I'm not, I'm not seen as a, as a community member because I've never lived there. Um, so the challenge was for me was, I guess, um, making those connections with people and, um, and yeah, I think that was probably. And I guess in terms of students, um, I wasn't so surprised, but I've had to develop strategies to manage this is helping them to manage their uncertainty mm. um, and to deal with the uncertainty and to stay flexible. They want an outcome. They want everything to be concrete by week five. And when things change, they find that very difficult. They find it very difficult to work with other disciplines and learn the language of other disciplines. So I see that as a critical aspect for law students to learn to work um, with social work, creative industries, even business. Um, that you know, They need to learn the language of other disciplines and the ways of thinking. Um, because for their future practice, that's going to be essential. So that's been the biggest challenge, I think, for students, from mm. a, for the law students. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, Vicky. How are you? Um, any formal skill or competency development assessments with the students participating in the program? I think. I think it, it's not so much a. Um, as informal assessment so much, but it's more of the reflection and being able to sit down with students on a regular basis and talk about um, what they're experiencing and, and what challenges they're, um, they're experiencing and, and such. I think a lot of, um, like I said, the, the, community, the community is the educator here. So it's about sort of talking to students about what they are learning from being in community. Well, and also, you know, with, you know, as I often say, with service learning, you know, the, the hyphen stands for reflection. So our, our main focus is not this on the skills, though, um, you know, obviously I talk about competence, um, cultural competency or, um, you know, humility, but it's them reflecting on the skills they have and um, their understandings and then, you know, where they and what they've learned and um, how they can then use that in their future professional practice. So, um, and as, as Deb said, you know, with our discussions, it's creating that safe place and for them to also realise that they can talk to people in the community. So we often, when we go to um, visit Sherberg, students may, you know, we have this long car trip with them. So we get to hear a lot about, you know, things that they're, what they're thinking about. Their, their basic lives, you know, the, the, what they're doing in their lives. So we actually get to know the students quite well. Mm. And that opens up new um, discussions. And then we'll say, oh, well, you know, let's have a chat to Auntie Sandra or Edwina when we're in community and see what she thinks. Um, she might be able to help you with this. So it, it's creating those connections for them with the community and helping them to develop their own understandings. So we, we don't always have the answers. That's mm. what Deb says, yeah. it's about community. We don't have the answers, but we can connect them with someone who does. Mm. So has, has, I hope, has that answered the questions? Um, 
That's, a, that's a great question. I think Vicki is probably muted right now, but maybe, ah, yes, we got to thank you. Um, okay. And I'm thank very you. aware of the time, so maybe we'll see if yeah. there are any other last burning questions, but I don't want to keep the two of you any longer since you've got a day to embark on, and many of us are just putting a bow on ours. Just yes, 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 and I bet you're all looking second. forward to that glass of wine and going. <laughs> 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 Absolutely, we need it to warm up around here. <laughs> yeah, well, so if you have our, um, our contact details, then we're really happy if you just want to send us an email or, or yep. whatnot. Yeah, just, just if it's something that you haven't had a chance to ask and would like to just follow up with an email, and we're very happy to answer it. That is absolutely wonderful. I cannot say thank you enough to the both of you for all of your time and sharing your insights and experience with us. I know that even though this is the second time I've had a chance to hear from you, I learned so much. I do have so many questions that you'll be hearing about me uh, from me, and uh, I will look forward to continuing our conversations. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Uh, you know, we've, we've I think we're quietly proud of that of this project. Yeah. Uh, we have received a university award for it, so we yeah. know. The, but it's great to be able to share it with you, and we'd really like to learn more about the projects you're doing as well. I think we can learn from each other. Absolutely, that's a fantastic outcome from these kinds of collaborations. Yeah. So thank you, Anne. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you everyone thank for you. listening. Have a great right. day, and have a good night thank to everyone all. here in Canada. All right, thank you. Bye bye. 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 You can... um, I am just going to. Yeah, just wait. Uh, uh.